encapsulation of this little, um, now I have to change, the speed of oscillation of this little um, red curve. If the red curve doesn't oscillate at all, it stays put, then you're going to cut straight. That was the picture we had before. If you move a little bit, right, you oscillate a little bit, then you're not going to be very far away from this straight line. And you get a curve like this. It looks a bit well, but not too much. But now if you increase the oscillation of, of the red curve, or alternatively, if you slow down the speed at which it cuts down into the path, you get a path that is a bit more wired like this. If you increase again the oscillation, you get a path that is wilder like that. Right? And you continue like this. And actually, here's a surprise. When, when you increase the oscillation even more, the path that you're going to construct will have double points. It will, you know, it's a little bit like you have your scissors, and sometimes you bounce onto the boundary, so you have part of your pastry that is lost, that you throw away. You know. but, but, and then you continue to the outside. And you create these type of random curves. These are the so-called schramm leuven evolutions, the uh, SLE processes. And you see that you have a one-parameter family of these guys. The larger ca this oscillation speed is, the more convoluted, the higher the dimension is of this path. What happens is that in each of the previous cases, okay, the results, when you wanted to prove anything about these previous re results, and all these numbers, 91 or uh, something, something, are obtained as follows. You want to find a random path. You prove something very important, which is that it behaves nicely in the limit when the lattice goes to zero with respect to these conformal tr angle preserving transformations. And therefore, you say, well, therefore, this random discrete path is going to be one of these guys in the limit for one oscillation speed. Each oscillation speed is defined a different path, random path, which is a different dimension, and each sort of model chooses his limit, its limit. And so one of these percolations, so the limit of the percolation picture of these outer boundary of this myopic random walk is this. So this is the limit, this guy that moves like this and pushing inside is the limit of this uh, beach, right? The boundary of that island that is sitting on the right. Now, to conclude, of course, you might have noticed that I've quoted no names. I did it deliberately, not because I didn't want to, I desperately wanted to quote the names, but I know that I don't want to distract you by saying this, he approved this, and then to explain, yeah, he proved this, and then, but partly, and then this other person came in. So it's a, everything, I, story I told you is, of course, a joint effort of many people. I was, you know, part of it, but not more than many others. In particular, the, the, the idea, you know, of, of defining this, random curve by pushing like this and having this red guy moving and push inside is due to Schramm, Odette Schramm, who is one, was a wonderful person who died in a, I mean, well, five years ago in a hiking accident in, in, in the mountains. And uh, now, you know, the, the entire field research has slowed down a lot because he's not there anymore. And Greg Lawler, Stas Smirnov, uh, who's a coming more from the complex analysis part, uh, got the Fields Medal 2010 for this conformal invariance of percolation and easing model. So, we, you know, it was, uh, uh, okay, and Vincent Befara was the one who worked out the, the dimensions of these random curves. And you have a long, long list of names, but I didn't want to, you know, impose uh, all that of you. I just mentioned those who correspond exactly to the results that uh, I, I've been mentioning. And I've been happy to, lucky to interact with all these great people. And everything I said, in some sense, almost the entire talk, the first half of the talk, could have been given by a theoretical physicist, physicist. And maybe it has. You know, maybe some of you remember that one of these people, or maybe Ninhois or Cardier, Duplantier, Polyakov, I don't know, was here 30 years ago and gave basically the same story. Except that there wasn't this idea of pushing and defining in random curves. But the phase transition, the trick critical exponents, the four thirds, the 91 or 48, they, were, they had arguments that were providing these uh, numbers, except that we mathematicians didn't, you know, uh, we didn't see them as proofs, full proofs. And I mean, they would say, yes, you are right, it's not a full proof, but so it's not like we are arguing, where everybody's good friends here in this picture. And they were the ones who came to us and tells you, here, we have something nice for you to prove, because uh, 
uh, and we, we said, very, thank you very much, and we're going to think about it. And, but this is one case where basically the, the, you know, there was an interaction and the input that came from the math world now with this you know, conformal story is useful also you know, in shedding some light into the theories that they have developed. So for instance, conformal field theory is, a, is the one of the, you know, or renormalization group is sort of code, li code names for what happened uh, behind the scenes there. Of course, the, everything you have also goes back to Anzager and to, if you're at the easy model, so to the old heroes of, uh, of uh, theoretical physics. So I hope uh, I, that was an entertaining story and I thank you for your attention. Thank you. We still have uh, some time for short questions. Yes. I thank you for the great talk. Thank you for the great talk. Um, I'm curious about the crucial cells. So uh, they, they appear in a way that they're random or there's any rule that govern the different... It's, uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing, these crucial cells. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of work going on, I mean, including by uh, many people, but uh, it's, it's very closely related to these uh, questions in computer science and the uh, stability of uh, things in Boolean functions. Uh, uh, sometimes I give a talk, you know, about stability of voting models or things like that. It's a little bit like if you would imagine that you have a voting system where, which is hierarchical, where each you are subdividing each guy has, uh, is, you know, you, you regroup by packs of three. You see who has the majority, and this majority is promoted to the next level, and then you are regrouping again the next levels by packs of three, and you continue like that. And then the answer, and if at the bottom everyone tossed a coin plus minus to decide, at the end, in that very simple model, it's very, it's very easy to work out that in the end you have plenty of guys who are, at, uh, it's likely that you have plenty of guys sitting at the bottom level that have the property that if you would have changed, the, if, they, if you change their color, then this pr is propagating all the way up. And, um, and this is sort of... Uh, yeah, it's a sort of stability of Boolean nonlinear Boolean function. It's very closely related to the fact that um, the model is unstable. You have these uh, crucial points. Um, they are selected. It's, it's hard to explain because in the limit, you have uncountably many. Then it becomes a fractal set. But um, uh, how, could I, how could I explain? It's probably it's, it's better seen by this pack of, if you don't look at it geometrically, right? You just look at this with a tree-like structure, with an election, where you look at packs of three, and at each level, it's two to one or three nil, and then you continue like that. You know, or you, you do a, a, okay. Then what you see is that you didn't know at first who was going to, to, to win. And in order to find who was important, you can go from upside down. What you're doing is you have this guy, he's been elected two to one. So what you're going to keep is the two guys who voted two, because if any one of these two guys would have voted the other direction, then their outcome would have been different. And then these two guys, again, one of the, you know, if they're elected two to one, you look at the two, two, uh, at, at the two descendants. So you go upside down. It's very simple calculation to see that if you have three goals in the soccer game, the probability that the, it's three nil is one quarter, and the, otherwise it's three quarter. So basically each guy has three quarter, has 75 percent chances of having two children in this picture. So in average, three half children, 1.5, so it has a positive probability to go all the way down. And it's a similar question, in, it's, in some sense it's a similar thing in that case. So there, in order to decide who's winning, I mean, who, who's, who's a crucial cell, you have to know everything that happens around you. But the best way to detect this is go to go up, upside, you know, from top to bottom. Uh, okay. to, to unravel, to discover them progressively, uh, you know, from scales going down. 
Can you comment on bond percolation and site percolation? Is there some ah. differences between? Uh, okay. Um, don't worry, the answer will be shorter. Um, <laughs> yeah, you have percolation, you have different models. Uh, the one I showed was you have cells that are colored in black or white. This is what we like to call site percolation. You have a model that is called bond percolation where you have a graph and it's not the sides of the graphs that are open or closed, but it's the edges. This is what we call bond percolation. And uh, basically the, the belief is that the limit of critical bond percolation or site percolation in two dimensions, they all are the same. So there's no difference there. The difference is that there's just one model where we can prove that. <laughs> it's this particular site percolation on, on, on I showed you. But uh, apart from that, the, the belief is the same, uh, that, that it has the same universal limit in the continuum when you look at precisely the point where you have just winning. So your lecture was very beautiful and very complete. I want to provoke a little bit. Uh, how about uh, higher dimensions? Ah, um, well, it's a nice, uh, uh, of course, open question. We want we are li we are not living in two dimensions. You know, we are living in a higher dimensions, and we want to understand self-avoiding paths in higher dimensions. And the biologists tell you that DNA and whatever you know you want is our self You know, you want to find the structure of these uh, very wild. Um, three-dimensional uh, paths. The answer is that for mathematicians, we know there are no complex numbers in three dimensions. There's no Riemann mapping theorem. If I give you, you know, instead of giving a flat pastry, I give you a ball. I tell you, you're trying to distort that ball progressively in such a way that everything you preserve the angles in there, and you say, well, I can't do it. It's, 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 it's solid. I can't, you know. So, so all the tools that we use here that make, made it possible to do anything don't work. It doesn't say that there's not a universal limit of, for myopic random walks in three dimensions. They should have a you know, universal limit. However, what physicists tell us, they will tell us it, it, there is this object like, like that that exists. That is, you can view it as a fixed point of some wild you know, renormalization function. Fine. So what? Well, probably there's nothing to prove about it because this guy's there. It has an infinite complexity and the mathematical tools in order to say anything about them are not there. It's not relating to any other parts of mathematics. It's a little bit like you say, here is a real number. Infinite sequence of digits. What can you say about it? Well, I don't know. I can you know, look at the digits one after the other, but it's just a number. It has no formula. It's just that number. And the belief is that the critical exponents in three dimensions, they are very interesting, very important, but there are no special numbers that you can relate to any other parts of mathematics. So uh, we are, have no job to do as mathematicians. You can do simulations to try to approximate them, but we, we have nothing to say about it. It's, um, uh, you know, when very often people ask, you know, what do you prove when you do mathematics? Well, here what we had, in some sense, is we, we had two objects. First one is, let's say, four-thirds. That's a number. We know it's four-thirds. It's four divided by three. And we had, on the other side, we had this, there's this fractal object that you can define that has a special dimension. And we said this dimension that we defined by, you know, this random blah, 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 is equal to four-thirds. So we related two different things, of course, that, you know, uh, that had different coming from different uh, horizons, and said, this is the same. Three-dimensional space is basically, uh, in, in, for, for all these questions, is just living on its, its own life, and we can't catch it for the moment. Maybe some, some clever mathematicians, uh, our students, or students of our students, or whatever, will find a way to catch them, and will tell us that, you know, grandpa was wrong, but uh, I, I don't believe that I will see a critical exponent to, or, Physicists tell us there's nothing to look for. However, physicists also tell us, and maybe there are some in the room, that 
String theory, you know, they, you hear these stories that you know, these wild dimensions, you know, uh, nice in certain space, dimensional spaces, some nice things happen. And why do they tell us that? Because in there, you can actually relate these certain things happening in string theory to certain other things. Some structure is going on. You can, there's some mathematics, mathematical meat there. And so the very same Polyakov I mentioned, you know, there was the one who started with Knizhnik, uh, Zamolodnikov, the conformal field theory. Uh, he's the one or one, one of the founders of string theory as well. So he continued using, implementing the same type of idea. So, so high dimension three, no, but maybe, you know, four, 16, whatever, 25, 24, maybe something in that spirit is uh, <coughs> remaining in, in, in one of these magical uh, dimensions that we have. I just want to remark that we are surrounded by physicists here. I know, I know, I, I, it's very interesting because I can recognize uh, where, where they are. Dep when I give this type of talk, I can see sometimes, I see, some people get very, you know, say, hmm, what, what is he going to say, you know? Uh, I, it's, it's a nice thing, this subject to work on was a very nice experience for me, uh, because I, I belong to the, you know, uh, people who at some point said, okay, I, I like math, I like physics, what do I choose when I study? And then, you know, if you go back in time, you say, how did you choose what you study? Well, it was like, you know, there was this teacher, there was this boring course, there was a, uh, or, okay. But you just wanted to, uh, you know, uh, understand the, in some sense, I, I always, this anecdote I usually give is that I understood all, when my physics teacher in high school, you know, when she told us about Newton's law, and I said, I don't understand Newton's law. She said, why do you understand? It's one of our R squares. I said, no, it's not, you know, that you have to explain us how, how the Earth communicates with the Moon. You know, how does the Moon know that it has to turn? And they said, ah, no, you're lost for, some, you know, you're going to be a scientist, you are asking these type of uh, stupid questions because you just have to accept the rule, the rule is, that, okay. And so when you're asking this type of question, you can up either in certain parts of mathematics or certain parts of physics, but the physicists who are on the other side, they are, in some sense, you, if you would have chosen another direction. You know, it's, it's this sort of, this, you, you, you meet these people, you don't understand them anymore, they follow a different trajectory. You, you see that when they're talking, trying to explain to you what they're doing, you don't really understand what they're doing anymore. But you recognize yourself somehow. You say, I, I could be that guy uh, trying to explain that to me, and uh, I could be that guy who actually understands what conformal field theory is, but now I'm on the other side, I, I'm the stubborn guy, I said, no, I don't, this is not, you know, this is not math, sorry. Um, and, um, and I guess this particular field was nice because there was never a competition somehow in, in this uh, who proves what, and it was really sort of uh, the rules of the game were different, and uh, of course the people involved, the physics, physicists there were just wonderful, nice, and just very generous and tell us, here's a nice problem to play with for you mathematicians, have fun. And when we came back with sort of ideas and proofs, they said, oh, great, you know. They didn't say, oh, we knew that before, you know. We had, uh, <laughs> so, so this was a, a very nice experience, but I guess it's important that for all of us who, you know, when we interact, and of course here in the sort of academy is this important object, that we are not here to try to get, you know, uh, I want to elect a chemist, you know, I have to kick out the mathematician or, okay. This is not the, this is not the, that we should remind sort of that, um, yeah, we are all sort of part of a global community and, uh, uh, and there's a lot of, uh, I mean, the interaction can be very fruitful. Not always, you know, sometimes we just don't understand each other and that's fine like this. But uh, in, in, in many instances still there's a lot of uh, exchange to be done. Okay, I think we should thank our speaker again.